Okay, so our last session just before lunch, um, it's a little bit shorter and um, it's going to be presented by Rebecca King, who is with the Hypersomnia Foundation. And just one last comment uh, again, Caitlin, Dr. Morse, thank you for your presentations this morning. We do have a section on our website that specifically um, explores clinical trials and lists the current ones that are open. So check that out if you're interested in being involved. Thank you, Rebecca. This is a doctor, Dr. Sigrid Vesey. She practices right here in Philadelphia at the University of Pennsylvania Sleep Medicine Center. And she is not only a practicing doctor, she is also a basic sleep researcher. And I met her probably five years ago when we were in Washington, D.C. together, part of a group of people running around trying to meet with our elected representatives to advocate for the needs of sleepy people. For example, we were trying to advocate for additional funding at NIH for sleep research. And so as we were walking around between meetings, we were getting to know each other, and we got on a conversation about how difficult it is to conduct research into idiopathic hypersomnia and narcolepsy type 2, because we just don't know anything about it. And she said something that really struck home, which is that we don't even know today whether or not idiopathic hypersomnia is a disruption of wake or a disruption of sleep. Even the basic questions we can't answer. So this is a really, really difficult road doing research into hypersomnias. But we, we want to try, and the Hypersomnia Foundation has made it part of our mission to figure out how we can support our researchers as they struggle to answer the questions. So first you have to understand what do the researchers need? What support do they need? And I'd love to think that they could just run down to the NIH and throw out a great idea and walk away with a big grant, and that's all it would take. So what they have to do is put together a pretty detailed application with their idea and all the smart people they're going to need and all the equipment they're going to need. But one thing that I didn't realize that they needed to include in their NIH application is compelling initial research results. They have to demonstrate that the idea has some merit and is worthy of investment. So how do you get that? You have to do the initial research before you can approach the NIH. And you have to have an idea and very smart people and equipment and all of that costs money. So one of the biggest challenges for our researchers is getting that initial funding so they can create compelling initial research results to ask for a big grant. And that's where patient foundations and other foundations come in to provide that funding. So we were advised to start a research award program and we did so about five, six years ago. Members of the community donated money specifically for research. So we had a little pot and we said, hey, who out there is trying to do research? We would love to help. And we said, since this is money coming from our community, our patient community, we wanted to make sure that the research that we were funding was in alignment with what you all most care about. Fortunately, there was a study done around this time asking our patient community the very question about what do you most value when it comes to hypersomnia research. And the number one thing everyone wants to know is what causes the non-cataplactic hypersomnias, idiopathic hypersomnia and NT2, because we just don't know the cause. And in the science world, when you discover a cause, you call it an etiology. We believe that all of those of us with the idiopathic hypersomnia and narcolepsy type 2 diagnoses probably have multiple root causes for different subsets of it. So each time you discover a new etiology, you kind of define the disease for that specific cause, and that's called a phenotype. And then what you really, really want is to have a biomarker or something that can be tested and detected that tells you that this particular individual has this particular cause for the disorder. So right now, we don't have any good biomarkers and we are desperate to find some. The fourth thing that came out of the survey was the, a desire for personalized medicine. And what I mean by that is, we're very fortunate today in hypersomnia that there's a decently long list of medicines that we can try but we don't have a good understanding of which medicine has the best possibility of helping each individual person. 
So if we had a better understanding for each individual what the root cause was of their disease, then we could potentially learn which medicines to try first instead of today what we do is we try everything and hope something sticks. So we, that's what we made as the priorities of our program. And of course, we also had the overarching goal of saying we would really prefer to fund initial research that is going to lead to bigger grants in the future. So a couple of years went by. We made a couple very small grants, but it wasn't really accomplishing what we wanted. So we kind of sat back and said, what's going on with our program? And the first thing that we noticed is we're just kind of small potatoes. The amount of money we could give to any particular grant was too small to be able to allow that researcher to do the research that they needed to do. The second issue was we didn't quite have connection to all the researchers literally around the globe who could benefit from these grant programs. We didn't have had a hard time reaching them. And the third issue was it takes a pretty sophisticated process to run a grant program and assess grant applications and manage grants through the life cycle. So then we learned that there is an AASM foundation. AASM stands for American Academy of Sleep Medicine. That's a group of thousands of sleep doctors and researchers who have been around uh, for a long time and about 25 years ago they decided that they needed their own foundation because they wanted to fund grants into sleep medicine questions as well. So over the past 25 years, they have given out $25 million and they're going strong. So we approached um, this organization, met the wonderful people who run it, and learned that they have lots more potatoes than we do. They also have global reach. They've got you know, email lists of thousands of people. They're very, very well connected. And they have an extremely robust process for issuing grant opportunities, assessing those grants, awarding the grants, and managing through the process. So they had everything we lacked. But they were very open to the idea of, for the first time, partnering with a patient foundation to co-fund grants together. That was our new idea. So our very first year of trying this structure was 2022. This is the advertisement that went out around the world. We sent it to everybody we could think of. They sent it to everybody they could think of. And you can see that there's three different categories of grants available, with the largest category being up to $250,000. So of course, that attracts way more attention than what we could do on our own. <clears throat> So what happened in that first year? We found a program uh, with Dr. Maggie Blattner that the Hypersomnia Foundation co-funded along with AASMF. And our arrangement was that for every $1 we would put into a research grant, they would put in $3. So what was so important is we could leverage the hard you know, won generous donations from our community that literally quadrupled the value and put it into a program that we strongly believed in. So Dr. Blattner had an idea for what if you could use mobile technology to do sleep studies on people with hypersomnia in their homes over a longer period of time. So instead of being stuck to you know, the, the hospital in an unusual environment for you and only having a limited amount of time to do the study, you could take it home and have it for a couple of days. And especially for those of us with long sleep, you could truly demonstrate how much sleep you're actually doing over a 24-hour period. So that's what she's working on. She asked for $100,000, so we put in $25,000 and ASM put in the rest. ASM also found another program that they thought was valuable and they funded it um, for Dr. Zhu up in Boston and he is looking at providing, providing support for uh, young people diagnosed with hypersomnia and uh, some of the difficulties they face with their social relationships. Also what happened in that year, there was another application that the ASM Foundation, it didn't fit within their guidelines. But it definitely related to something we cared about at hypersomnia. So um, these three gentlemen are sleep researchers, and they do a lot of imaging studies. And they have connected with other researchers around the world who also do imaging studies. And what they were saying is, we all have a few imaging studies, but what we really want to do is pool the data together. 
So they needed some financial support in order to get that consortium up and running. And so we went back home and the Hypersomnia Foundation through our own reward program has provided them a grant. So actually three organizations received grants in 2022. So originally this was, you know, just going to be one year and it was done. But when we sat back and said, what happened? We were really happy and there were a lot of great applications. So we're like, should we try it again? And we said yes, AASM said yes, and then the Wake Up Narcolepsy organization said, we want in too. So now there are three foundations pooling funds and we decided to go again in 2023. The Hypersomnia Foundation uh, in that round decided to co-fund a clinical trial of Solreamphetol in people with IH. So this is the medication you know at Cisnosi. Nobody's ever tried it in idiopathic hypersomnia. And Dr. Dovier and his team in France have extensive experience conducting clinical trials in idiopathic hypersomnia. So we are really excited to finally see, does this medicine help us and get that proof? One of the reasons it's really, really important to do these clinical trials is that there's something called clinical practice guidelines that AASM puts out. And basically, this is a document that says, for idiopathic hypersomnia, these are the medicines that have been demonstrated to be safe and effective. So right now, Solreamphetol is not on the clinical practice guidelines for IH. But if we can prove through this trial that it's successful, then we can go back to AASM and ask for them to update those practice records and get a new medication on there. So now all the doctors who use these practice guidelines, they refer to them to say, I've got a patient with IH, what can we try? And so you know, we would get a new medicine for them to try. So that is hugely beneficial in our, in our clinical space. In the insurance space, this is still off-label. This clinical trial will not be able to get FDA approval or the European approval for their medicines. But if you're trying to appeal a denial for an off-label prescription, sometimes you're asked to provide two documents or two papers in order to demonstrate that this medicine is used to treat this disorder and it's safe and effective. So after the clinical trial, what usually comes out are journal articles. So now, when you're fighting your appeal, you'll have the clinical practice guidelines that you can attach to your appeal, and you'll have journal articles you can attach to the appeal to demonstrate to the insurance company that this is a medication appropriate for IH. Wake Up Narcolepsy uh, decided to co-fund a different study on imaging in the brainstem and hypothalamus. And what's so exciting about this particular study is that the brainstem and the hypothalamus are in the inside, in the center of the brain. And most imaging capability can't reach that far with any you know, clarity. So Dr. Lewis up at MIH has access to the most advanced fMRI machinery in the world. There's you know, only certain of these machines in certain locations, and she's got one. And her sleep research to date has been using this technology to discover new things about sleep. So she came to us and said, right now we don't even know whether or not we can see into the brainstem and hypothalamus and detect differences for sleep and sleepy people. So we're gonna use healthy people to try and develop the techniques. And if we're successful in this research project, then we'll come back in a year or two and propose to use the newly developed capability to study people with hypersomnia. So this really is a big sort of moonshot for us and very excited that somebody who's not in the hypersomnia world came forth and said, I, I would like to take some of our ability and tech expertise and see if we can find something to help you all. In addition to the two projects that the patient organizations co-funded, the AASM Foundation also funded two uh, projects here listed at the bottom. Uh, the one on the left is to talk about it, see whether or not a keto diet might help at the, with the symptoms of hypersomnia. And this imaging rehearsal therapy is a therapy that was developed for people with PTSD who are dealing with severe uh, nightmares. And so they've seen it successful in PTSD. So these researchers want to come and study these techniques in people with hypersomnia to see if they can help us. So 
our uh, co-funded project for Sol Riempital was one of the $250,000 projects. So they got the maximum award possible, which means that we, the Hypersomnia Foundation, needed to put in 25%, which was $62,500. But in the whole grant cycle, almost $700,000 now went into hypersomnia. And this would not have happened because this grant cycle would not have even existed had not Wake Up Narcolepsy and the Hypersomnia Foundation agreed with the AASM to, to fund the cycle as well. So we're very, very happy with the partnership. We're thrilled with the expertise that they have to run this program very, very well, and our ability to turn essentially $62,500 of your money into almost $700,000 out in the research world. So should we do it again, <laughs> right? And we went back to ASM Foundation and said, can we keep going? We know you wouldn't normally keep running hypersomnia grant programs year after year. And they said, if you guys are in, we're in. Their board voted to, to support us. So in order to do that, we need to come up with $62,500 pretty much every year to participate um, so the bad news is we did have that research fund that I told you about, and over the past couple of years, we've spent it, and so we only have $11,000 left. So I am here today to talk about what we're doing, but also to ask if you have the ability to support us in re replenishing this fund so we can participate in this upcoming year. We do need your help. And I do want to talk a little bit about donations and why they're, they're important for the Hypersomnia Foundation and where they go, because this was something I didn't understand when I first joined. So there really are two sources of funds for an organization like ourselves. And on one side, we have these wonderful partnerships with pharmaceutical companies. And they provide grants to us that help provide many of the programs and services that you receive as our community. So anything that has to do with an event like this, and, you know, and paying for this conference room and paying for the audiovisual equipment and all that stuff. And the Unite program, that takes some funding. That is also supported by pharmaceutical donations and content being developed for social media and our website. Um, that is all coming largely from that source. But the other elements that we have to pay for as a foundation are fully dependent on donations from the community. And that is pretty much the staff that we have that organizes and makes all this happen. Their salary it needs to be funded from the community. The operational expenses, all those nuts and bolts it takes to just have an organization at all. And then last but certainly not least, any research funding. So we, in order to keep going in research, we do need community support. So on our website, you will find there are multiple ways to donate. I'm just going to highlight real quickly. There's a few where every dollar you give does go into the research fund or our operational funds. And that's things like setting up a monthly transfer from your bank or just writing a check. Facebook has a nice, easy way for you to donate where they don't take fees and all the funds come to us. And of course, if, there, if you have access to a company matching program, those are wonderful because they can hopefully double your gift. There are other ways online that might be, be more convenient to you, using a credit card on our website, PayPal or Global Giving. Um, those are all easy ways to give on our website, but they, I just want you to know that they do have some fees. So in summary, we want this to grow. We feel like we're at the little beginnings and we're just starting to spiral outward. And how do you manage this and how do you grow this so that we can actually get at sort of a robust research portfolio? So we've got a lot of questions to answer, a long way to go. That QR code does take you to the, our website where you can donate if you possibly can. And I just want to say there's a few of us at the foundation that are kind of heavily involved in the research side. I'm one of them. If you want to know anything, come up and ask me afterwards. Or you can email info at Hypersomnia Foundation that you want to talk to somebody about research, and that'll get to me, and I'm happy to talk to you. In case you just in, if, if you want to know, that's fine. And then if you want to know, um, you're trying to decide whether or not to donate, I'm happy to talk about that as well. Thank you very much, Rebecca.
with with that, while we have Rebecca here, I've got a couple of minutes before lunch. Any questions for her? Yes. I'm curious, and it may be too soon, but have any of the grants that you've awarded led to larger grants through institutions like NIH? They have not. So of the very first two small ones, um, one, of, one of them kind of did the research and didn't find anything compelling that they could follow on, and the other one is still ongoing. And then everything that you've seen that was awarded in 22 and, and 23, uh, the, the folks from 20, 2023 just found out like in the last couple of weeks. And then the other ones are kind of at the beginning or in the middle of, of doing their research. That, that would be ideal. Yeah. <laughs> Very competitive. Um, reg regarding everything's grouped with narcolepsy type 2 and idiopathic hypersomnia. And I guess for practical purposes or clinical purposes, they look at both of them. However, insurance companies don't look at it that way, and they treat them completely different. I know there was a few studies or a few um, things going on in, in, in the Europe front where they were saying that there's really, it's very difficult to differentiate between the two. Now, I know in this country with insurance companies, which is what we're all looking to get motivated to help us, they treat them completely different. Are there any studies out there that, I actually read one that says that if you do several different MLSTs, you'll get different results. Yes. Now, I'm one shy REM, so I have one dream short of being uh, diagnosed with narcolepsy type two. Yeah. If you're diagnosed with narcolepsy type two, there's a whole host of FDA approved drugs. If you're diagnosed with idiopathic hypersomnia, there were none up until very recently, and now there's only one. And for most insurance companies, and it seems like the larger the insurance company, the more difficult it is, because they throw around this FDA approval. Is there anything going on where the DSM is gonna be recategorized and they're gonna be lumped together? Or like, what's the deal with that, like for our purposes, where we can get access to a, a lot more medications that we don't have access to now? Are you familiar with like anything or? I am, that is such a huge topic. <laughs> so the, you know, all the diagnostic cat categories are set forth in the DSM right now and they just did a little update but they didn't change the category as much and so that's not changing. But that doesn't mean there isn't a huge discussion going on in the global reach search community as to whether or not we've properly put different diagnoses in the same bucket. And in fact, um, there was a, a proposal by a group of European researchers a few years ago through a paper that they wrote that basically said they would take our bucket and say folks with NT1 are in one bucket, folks with idiopathic hypersomnia with long sleep are in their own bucket, and then those folks with idiopathic hypersomnia without long sleep and narcolepsy type 2 are sort of in the same bucket. So that discussion is going on. There have been other papers where they've actually done like mathematical modeling and taking the symptom profile of thousands of people with different hypersomnias and saying, you, the program, cluster them. And they, that's what ends up happening. IH with long sleep is its own cluster. NT1 is its own cluster. And everybody else is sort of the messy middle. The problem is, is we don't really have good ways of diagnosing things, and so in, to put folks in those categories, so that's what the Europe, European paper was about. It was about if we did these tests and had these standards, then we could put people in these buckets. But for one of the flaws of the way that we do sleep tests today is we don't let people sleep as much as they can, so we can't get the data for who belongs in the idiopathic hypersomnia with long sleep time. And in fact, Dr. Dovier in France, who we co-funded, his team and a few other teams across Europe have started to change the way they do sleep studies and keep people in the sleep centers for you know, two, three days to measure more things in order to more accurately put them in the buckets. And so Dr. Maggie Blattner's project was sort of very timely because it's the first time sort of an American research group is trying to say, how could we change the way we do sleep studies to better categories the folks with long sleep. But it takes years for these discussions to go on and for the doctors essentially to change the way they put people in buckets. 
It's a great answer to a really big question. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone else? Okay. All right, thank you, Rebecca.